Well, I appreciate you all being here. I look forward to this conference every year because you are the movers and shakers. You are the ones that get to control the operation of your emergency department to some degree. To some degree, I realize that you all have constraints uh, placed upon you, but you're all here to try to make your places better. And the majority of this conference is, will be about trying to do things more efficiently. And with the, fo the focus is not really on clinical medicine, except now. This one talk on clinical medicine that um, really points out the opportunities for us to do narrow variability. For, but, and so one of the things I want to do is show you what the variability is, just by some examples. So this book, like if you want to make the pot roast, you've got a company coming over. It's kind of an important company coming over. You want to make sure the pot roast is right. What do you do? You go to this book. You know, there's no experimentation. There's no uh, trial and error. You go to the book. Uh, and so, in many ways, cookbook medicine is kind of got the characteristics of going to a book, I'm going to get the outcomes that I want. So uh, 75 million of these things are uh, out there. Most of you or your parents uh, have a Betty Crocker cookbook. Um, is there a reason that plane crashes crash so are infrequently? Anybody have, have an, any idea about that? It's called cookbook flying. They have a checklist, and they use the checklist every time. And if they've flown 10,000 uh, uh, takeoffs and landings, they still use the checklist. They have no choice but to use a checklist. I think the, the co-pilot's there is to make sure that the pilot uses the checklist. They're, I think they're checking on each other. So the idea here is they use the checklist. And uh, why, why in particular are they motivated to use a checklist? Because if we use a check, uh, don't use a checklist, and as a result somebody uh, gets hurt, well, it's them, it's not us. If these guys screw up the checklist, they're the first to, ma to make it to the ground vertically. So they're basically highly motivated to use a checklist. As a matter of fact, pilots began the use of checklists. The, the, the checklists were not imposed on pilots, Pilot said, let's do this, let's create this for safety. So here, here are some numbers. I got these numbers. I don't know whether these true are true or, are true or not, but it basically kind of puts into perspective some of the opportunities. So the first one says 150,000 people per year needlessly killed. Oh, needlessly killed. There must be the needed killed and the needlessly killed. But in any case, <laughs> they're, they're talking about um, people who are misdiagnosed, and as a result of misdiagnosis, 150,000 people die. This is basically doctor's offices. But we're all about diagnosis in emergency medicine. I mean, that's the business of emergency medicine makes the diagnosis. Once you make the diagnosis, you go to, cook, to, go to the cookbook and tell you, how, tell you how to fix it. But if you don't know what you're fixing, you know, you're up the crick. 4,000 uh, times the surgeons are putting stuff into, or uh, leaving stuff in the abdomen kind of thing, cutting off the wrong leg and all that kind of stuff. You've heard of those. And, and we made strong efforts to decrease this. I didn't know this last one, though. Basically, critically ill patients, which we see critically ill patients, often die because they have undiscovered, uh, hidden, undiagnosed I issues that are, are going to be the factor to take them out that we basically just uh, have not sought, found, and, and, and resolved. So bottom line is there are, are lots of opportunities. And so this guy came along, Atul Gawande. Ever, anybody ever hear of this guy? He's a, a surgeon out of uh, Brigham and Women's. And uh, he wrote this book called The Checklist Manifesto, which was on the top seller list of every, every bestseller list you can think of. His book was there. Uh, it was done uh, about error in medicine. And he basically concluded that, uh, you know, through a long pathway, that the way to fix this, as best we can at least, uh, particularly in the world of surgery, is, that, is to use checkbooks. And he basically said, uh, checkbooks, checkmark, uh, ch checkbook, checklist that we ought to follow. He said, basically, we make two kinds of error. One, one error is an error of ignorance, and that's a tough error to fix. Second error is an error of ineptitude. We, are, we know what we're basically doing, but we make silly and stupid mistakes, um, not making proper use of what we know. So one of the things that is the, the, the best example of that is when people go into surgery and now they have these timeouts and all this other stuff to do to make sure that there are no mistakes going to be made in this case. He says complex processes need checklists. Um, and he also says that you need to be humble. 
to use a checklist. You can understand that. You know, we don't like being here, follow the checklist. Uh, who says? Uh, you know, we're quite independent uh, uh, individuals, and we don't like the idea of saying, follow the checklist. There are ways to make the checklists more uh, appealing to physicians in particular. It's, it's if they have something to do with creating the checklist. So it's not jammed down their throat, but we said, okay, let's look at the evidence, and by the, using the evidence, well, let's create a checklist so that we can address this uh, diagnosis as best we can. So humility basically was uh, a, a part of this, and I can see that, and basically the idea that pilots were involved. I think to start out with, we have 800,000 physicians in, in this country doing it their way. Um, and the idea is, we is talk about herding cats. Um, humility, there may be a little short supply of humility in the medical profession. I, I don't want to make a generalization now, but, uh, and you need humility. The resistors are going to say, uh, no, 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 a medicine is an art. It cannot be uh, re reduced to a checklist. Come on, you know, this is, it, it's an art. As a matter of fact, in one of the recent um, emergency medicine newspapers, there was an article about comparing uh, medicine with flying. And in the next issue, there was a person who responded with the, the same um, resistor argument, oh no, it's an art, you cannot reduce it. They were really pissed off that uh, that, that had uh, even, even been written, and they were just angry, angry, angry. Um, so there's some ways to attenuate th this anger. You know, you can call something a rule, but you can't break rules. They're not negotiable. You can't break rules. Standards, we have, we have pulled our standards. There's no breaking standards either. You follow the rule. Uh, there's a rule, you follow the standards. So let's create some softer terms. Here's a guideline. Guideline. You're free to choose it, not choose it. It's a guideline. We're helping to guide you. We're going to guide you. Recommendation. I recommend the Chateaubriand. You don't have to get the Chateaubriand, but you, I recommend the Chateaubriand kind of thing. Or the pathway. It's going through the fields and the woods, and the, and, the, and, the, and the birds are singing, and we're on the pathway. You know, it's a gentle word, you know, pathway. Here's a one of the things that came out a long time ago about this timeout. So I had an arthroscopy uh, a couple of months ago, and basically they do this. They basically, they don't want to make any mistakes. So they ask you your name. Then they verify that your name is on the name brand kind of thing. And then they basically say, what is your problem with? And they say, that knee. And then the, the surgery come, guy comes over and says, and says, I think it's the right knee. And they look at the x-ray, and, and they make a mark, hopefully on the right and the correct knee. But they go through this very rigidly, and it, and it is a checklist process, and there's no variation from it. Um, it can be a little silly, though, because this idea of we're going to do something universally throughout the hospital. We're all going to, when there's procedures, we're going to do the uh, check, uh, timeout, timeout. But, you know, in the emergency department, some of the procedures really are not complex. For complex procedures, checklists are great, but the idea of a timeout for... You go in the room, are you the patient with a three-inch laceration on their face? Uh, let, me, let me check your name band. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I guess, that, I, I guess that's you. And you see this going on down there. It's like, it's silly, it's stupid. Are you the one with the dislocated shoulder? You know? <laughs> and they do the same thing with medications. You know, it probably takes 15 minutes to get an aspirin to do all these, th these things that are required. I want to talk, give you some examples of the variability that we're interested in. So, you know, kids get bumped in the head all the time, and one of the issues is, well, do we cat do a CAT scan? We know that kids are more susceptible to the radiation of a CAT scan, and so the idea here is maybe we should try to limit CAT scans that, uh, to the extent we can, because CAT scans have been associated, no question, with uh, uh, tumors. So they've come up with uh, these g rules, guidelines, you know, standards, whatever you want to call them. Basically, guidelines are probably the best. And, and look at how they've tried to do this. Look at all the work that has been put into trying to define a set of criteria about who ought to get cancer and who does not. PCARN, 42,000 kids were involved in the PCARN uh, uh, investigations. The CATCH trial, 3,800, you can do that on one foot, 3,800 patients. 
The Chalice trial was, a, was part of the a British Endeavor, 23,000 patients, all to answer the question, what kids don't have to have a CAT scan when they bump their head? A lot of work has gone into there, a lot of expense. All the, all, they've all been validated. PCARN is probably the best of the best. Well, here's a study published in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2014, 25 large EDs. And uh, basically, these are teaching hospitals, urban teaching type places. They looked at 42,000 kids. And in one emergency department, 19% of the kids who bumped their head got a CAT scan. And in another emergency department, 69% of the kids who bumped their head got a CAT scan. 19, 69. And every possible reason between why one was different was looked at and it was canceled. It wasn't because one hospital had more head, head trauma than the other. Uh, there, there was no way that you could figure out why that occurred. I think it occurred because it was a, a culture at the 69% at the, at the hospital. Oh, yeah, we always get cat scanned. You, 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 you can never be too safe, you know? I don't want to be sued. Da, 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 da. At the 19%, lean and mean. The fact of the matter is you can't use lawsuits to, 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 to determine uh, basically what is the optimal pathway since lawsuits in emergency medicine are so rare. So the idea here basically is um, huge variation. Now, this is, this is an art of some degree. Sure, I agree that, and not everybody's the same, but 20%, 70%, 20%, this needs to be fixed. But you only can fix this if you have the data. And the Emergency Department Benchmarking Alliance is about getting the data. This is how you get the data. Um, there's a community hospital study there, 1,007 kids who bumped their head. Two of them had intracranial injuries. None of them required surgery. So two out of 1,000. So 998 kids are getting a CAT scan or their head, getting their you know, uh, five or 10 millisieverts. And the, one of the other things about it is that radiation to the head has been shown to decrease your mental acuity. It means it makes you dumber. Uh, that's a way, that, I wouldn't explain it that way to, to, to mom, but that's one of the risks. And most people don't know that risk. They're basically aware that, well, we can get cancer kind of thing, or it costs a lot of money for this CAT, CAT scan machine. Uh, but uh, mental um, issues have clearly been demonstrated comparing radiation from hemangiomas on the face and the same amount of radiation for head CT evaluations. Here's ones that are, these are, are, are a, we, you have to pick out things that are where there are consequences. So PEs have consequences. We know that people can die from a PE. We also know that uh, there is a CT pulmonary angiogram where you in inject dye. There may be some risk in, in that dye for the, the kidneys. Uh, and there's the cost involved kind of thing. So um, the, the PIOPED study, which is a monster study, came out and said, here's the way you ought to evaluate somebody who has a PE. You do three things. Number one, you, you rank the, what is the likelihood of them having a PE clinically, low, intermediate, high. And if you don't feel that you're comfortable doing that yourself, there's the Wells rules, the, the modified Geneva scores, all of these other kinds of things that will help you set, determine low, medium, and high. The vast majority of people are low, so after you determine that this person is a low risk for PE, you do a D-dimer. D-dimer test is about clots that are dissolving, uh, the PE clot in, in specifically here. So the, uh, the D-dimer is done, the D-dimer is negative, the patient goes home. Low risk, negative D-dimer, they go home. We won't talk about the other two, just, just to keep it uh, simple for the sake of, uh, of the illustration. So the question is, do people follow this? It's really simple. It's really simple. You don't you need to embed this in a computer. It's just simple. So they taught these doctors at, at Scripps. Scripps is a big deal hospital. You know, it's very famous down there. Pre and post, this was an educational endeavor. They're a monthly meeting kind of thing. Uh, they also showed them their individual behavior, which is one of the key things that you need to do to vary on uh, limit variation. And ba basically, they found before the educational endeavor, that a quarter of the patients with low probability scan, uh, low probability well scores, received a CTPA without getting a D-dimer. And it's like, what? A quarter of the people who had low risk, they didn't do the D-dimer, and they did the CTPA. It's like, how could you, how can anybody, anybody explain that? 
This is scripts. These people are supposed to know what they're doing. The one, the one below that is even worse. Low probability for pulmonary embolism. A negative D-dimer. That's the one who's supposed to go home. Oh, let's do a CDPA anyway, kind of thing. You're on the way out, you know. So th these doctors were behaving terribly, terribly in the face of evidence-based guidelines on the treatment of, and the assessment of PE. After they taught these doctors about behaving better, they have behaved a little bit better, but certainly not as good as you had hoped. Here's the pre and post again. Uh, this is Scottish Rite Hospital. This, I don't know where this hospital is. Any of you from Scottish Rite Hospital? Oh, is it, where is it down there? Dallas. Based on this slide, I wouldn't go to that hospital. <laughs> Check this out. Check this out. So this is educational en uh, endeavor. Appropriate use of CT pulmonary angiogram before they, the, the teaching was 7%. 7% appropriate use of CT angiogram. It's like, huh? Is this, a, is, a, is, this a, is this a mistake? Is there a couple zeros missing here? After they taught the doctors how to be better, they uh, look for the documentation that is essential in every chart. Every chart that talks about a PE, you have to, you have to describe, is this a low probability patient, whether it's Wells, your, your own, your own and you have to have it in the chart, because that is the starting point. From there, everything else goes uh, thereafter. So nobody wrote in the chart anything about the risk scoring of this person. Appropriate use of CTPA, 6%. It went down. It went from horrible to unbelievable. <laughs> Only a third low likelihood patients, low likely for a PE, underwent D-dimer testing before getting a CTPA. It's like this was total out of control hospital. And no, total out of control physicians. These are, I've never seen results so horrible. I have no idea why they would choose to publish this. It's, it's like saying, don't come to our hospital. <laughs> I think I skipped one here. Here's another one out of Australia, 144 ED patients, pretest probability for PE documented in only 7%. They're all supposed to have it documented. D-dimer was ordered for a third of the low probability, pill, probability patients. D-dimer is ordered for a third of low probability. That's okay. 18% of those with a positive D-dimer did not get a CTPA. If you have low, pro low probability and a positive D-dimer, off the CTA uh, you go. These guys, <laughs> I would say, did, uh, did, they got the evidence here, evidence here, the final thing, CTPA? Oh, no, we're not going to do it. And, and I got one for you there, Miss Sherry. Intermountain Health. See that one coming up? 3,500 CT pulmonary angiograms, 45% of that imaging consistent with biopen. You know, that means 55 did not. There's a lot of people getting CT angiograms who don't. Of those getting CT pulmonary angiograms outside of the private guidelines, 83% were PE unlikely. PE unlikely and had no D-dimer done. PE unlikely, no D-dimer, off to the CTPA. It's like this is not difficult, but it shows you over and over and over. Honestly, I could take two hours to show you the magnitude of the problems. We're not talking about vernier caliper adjustments. We're talking about, you know, huge differences here. And the job of the ER directors is to identify those differences and to try to change them. And one of the ways you try to change them is charts, basically graphs. First of all, you, first of all you, the graph goes here, and, and, you're, and they tell you where you are in the graph, but they don't tell where any of your friends are. That's kind of like the secret graph. And then if you don't change, everybody's name gets put on the graph. So you can see where Frank is and Mary is and Joe is, and you're way out here. And as soon as you see the graph, people want to come under, underneath it, the comfort of it. Brigham and Women's has consistently published papers. There is somebody from Brigham and Women's here, isn't there? Uh, yeah. They've done at least five papers talking about how bad they are. How bad their CT ordering is for kids' heads, CT ordering in general. They, and this is another paper talking about... I have no idea what, what they're thinking about. This is Brigham and Women's. This is a big hospital, teaching hospital. Teaching hospital is t taking all of these residents. We're going to make you real smart. You're going to go to Brigham and Women's, Harvard, big, big, big time place. They had uh, 
This is 25 of their staff physicians, not the residents. This is the staff. These are the teachers of the residents. They looked at 1,500 cases before and educational inter inter intervention, and uh, about a similar case number of cases before uh, after. And they and they embedded into their CPOE system clinical decision support to help them make the very complex decisions that I just went through. Before they installed the, C the clinical decision support into the computer for, C uh, for order entry, uh, pre-intervention yield for PE diagnosis ranged from one doctor, one in 40 percent of his, or one in 40 of his or her patients had a PE, another doctor, one in five patients had a PE, one in 40, one in five. So let's put that, put that clinical decision support in there and let's see how it helps us. After they put it in, one doctor never made the diagnosis of, CT, of pulmonary embolism despite doing CTs. And another doctor, 38% of that doctor's patients turned out to have a PE. So only three physicians significantly improved their yield. You, you know, because we think that the that what's going to save us is that we're going to embed all of this stuff, all of these decision rules into the computers, and it doesn't seem, I've got another slide, it doesn't seem to work. I love the quote. This is, there was an editorial written by the, about how horrible these results were. Evidence suggests that voluntary self-remediation will not work. Restrictions of image ordering privileges. Restrictions of image ordering privileges? Doctor, you're not allowed to order CTPA unless you talk to somebody else. Restriction of, of image ordering privileges to be, uh, needs to be on the table as a potential policy to clue in the clueless. Clue in the clueless. I mean, these are not mincing any words here. Um, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, Dr. Smith, you're, you're not allowed to order any more Acolexeries. I'm sorry, we gotta get that checked out first before you can do that. Here's, I think this is the last one. Five hospital system, a quarter of a million patients. They looked at uh, ways to uh, decrease utilization of the CT for C-spines, brains, and PEs. This is, again, CPOE inside the instructions embedded into the CPOE. So while you're ordering, uh, it's going to ask you questions to guide you through these pathways. Uh, no change was made in the uh, uh, CT ordering um, at all by this system, no change. Well, they, you could have said, well, maybe these guys are really good, and so we don't need to have any change. No, not so fast. <laughs> Catch this. High prior CTPA users, they, they decreased their usage by a quarter. Hey, that's pretty good. High users went down by a quarter. Low users went up by uh, 46%. Low users, oh, we're going to increase by 46%. We're going to bring, we're going to, we're going to fix this. We've got a nice number here. How do we get that nice number? We've got high user down, low user up. Why shouldn't we, why should we not say, let's look at the low user and find out what the low user, utilizer is doing, how their, how their results are, are they getting sued, are they missing anything, and try to emulate the low user. It's, average is called average. Um, there was an initiative a long time ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago, where the federal government was going to develop guidelines to um, a whole variety of topics. And the first topic it picked was low back pain, because the literature is just so full of, of basic wrong stuff about what you ought to do. And so the idea was, don't get too many x-rays. That's, well, don't, 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 you know, only short period of bed rest. Um, mus muscle relaxers don't, aren't and uh, early ambulation, all kinds of things that l the literature sh shows works. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons found out that the government was doing this. The go it wasn't the government. The government brought together all these smart people, you know, who these researchers and all the, the data. They were just kind of the engine by which it was happening. And um, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons shut down the entire process. It, they said, can't be having the government be writing guidelines regarding uh, back pain. And uh, they went to their friends in Congress, and it, they shut it down. And so this en endeavor to write guidelines based on evidence and uh, learned people coming together under the auspices of the government 
this failed. So now this clearinghouse basically collects guidelines. They got 1,453 guidelines. Um, probably a lot of them are, that are, are duplicates. Britain has the uh, NICE guidelines, the N-I-C-E, I forget what that means, but they have guidelines that they have developed for their health system on just about everything known to man. And you, you, the fact is that we could do this relatively easy because we have the thing called the Cochrane, Cochrane Collaboration where the, where the Cochrane folks get together and answer a very discreet question. Is it a problem to give somebody a bottle of tetracaine to take home with them after they have a corneal abrasion? And the answer is, as best we know from the evidence that's there, is they can take the bottle with them. Um, so if you put all that together, you come up with very evidence-based answers to a lot of questions. There's a lot of ways that guidelines can uh, make problems. I don't want to go through specifically here. Guidelines are, are, can be very, very, very problematic in terms of they're not done properly, they, they're not done uh, frequently enough, there's biases in, in terms of the guidelines, they take the same data, come up with different answers, there's all kinds of ways. And so the people have come up with ways to write guidelines that are very, very rigid in terms of, if you want to write a guideline, here's what you need to do. Um, we need to narrow this variability. My goal here was to show you that the variability is monstrous, monstrous. And all of these create opportunities for us to do better because um, Right now, we're spending $10,000 a person a year. Canada's spending six. We rank uh, 37th in the World Health Organization listing of, of, um, of health. We, uh, we are surrounded by Costa Rica is above us. Slovenia is below us. Um, and this is a charge for the emergency department directors particularly. This is not easy. Of all the things that an ER director does, this is by far the most difficult. It's, it's, it's looking at the care provided by the physicians that work there and saying, um, we've got to measure, we've got to act like you know, men and women of science, we've got to, we've got to uh, make everybody more consistent so that patients can get the best health care they can. Uh, when you're out like this, there are a lot of patients who are getting bad health care. Um, and, and obviously it's expensive. So um, that's an uplift, uplifting tale uh, made, made to uh, kind of make you feel uh, angry, disappointed, but, there, but it has to be addressed. And I don't see a lot of people working on that part. They're working on, we'll make the, we'll make the department more efficient, we'll get people through quicker. Da, da, da. But what the, the work that is actually being done needs to be looked at. It takes a long time to do these CTPAs, when, when they, especially when they don't, don't need to be done. 